Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Seth Joyner Show. Here we go once again. Hey, listen, with March Madness going on, um, it seems like there's not a whole lot going on in the world of football. But I can tell you um, there is still a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, this is a talk to on Tuesday. So, yes, I'm taking your questions. But we're going to try something new and different today. Um, not only am I going to take your questions, but we're going to try, we're going to attempt to pull you guys into the show. And we're going to select some people along the way. Um, and my producer behind the scenes is going to um, be talking with you in the private chat. Um, she's going to send you a link so you can actually come on the Seth Joyner show interactively and have a quick conversation about the Philadelphia Eagles, the NFL, whatever it is that you want to talk about, okay? Hey, be nice. Don't be rude. Nothing vulgar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just trying to figure out ways to continue to enhance the show and get more and more people involved. I love your questions. I love the interaction. Um, so we're, we're going to try that out. Uh, today on the show a little later on first we're going to talk quarterbacks man because wow you know between last week's show and today you talk about a bunch of movement okay you've got Deshaun Watson being traded from the Texans and I know to some of you guys this is old news but I still got to do it um being traded from the Texans to the Cleveland Browns and then getting a five-year extension for $230 million, 100% guaranteed. And the Cleveland Browns gave up a lot. You know, I, I when I'm looking at some of these things that have transpired with the quarterbacks, I kind of in a lot of ways blame Sean McVay because he started all of this last year with the move to Matthew Stafford from um, Jared Goff and yes, it worked out for him. And you know that the NFL is a copycat type of league. So it seems like everybody's doing it. And there's a lot of movement going on with these quarterbacks. Um, who else? You got Matt Ryan, 14 years with the Atlanta Falcons. He gets traded to replace Carson Wentz in Indianapolis. There's another team that seems to be ready on both sides of the ball kind of like Cleveland, but they're short of a quarterback. And they've made massive moves and have given up. Well, you know, Indianapolis didn't give up a whole lot of third-round pick. That was shocking to me for Matt Ryan. But these teams are willing to give up a lot to get that piece at the end. And this kind of falls in line with my thinking about how the Eagles should handle Jalen Hurts. Build out the rest of your roster get solid across the board. And when you get to a point where you, you know, if Jalen Hurst isn't the guy, if he's not the answer, then use the assets down the road like Indy just did, like um, Cleveland just did, to get the piece that you need to take you over the top, okay? Um, listen, the, the, the quarterback, even though the, the market is just flush right now, there's a lot going on. There's some guys on the outside looking in. You know, you got Jimmy G. And at the end of the day, Garoppolo can stay right there. He can stay right there in San Francisco. It's not the optimal situation because I really feel like um, the 49ers want to move on. They want to give Trey Lance the reins. Um, but for some reason or not, another, there's not a whole lot of interest, you know, in Jimmy G. Then you got Baker Mayfield. And I always say, be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you wish for, okay? Sometimes your ego and your pride can get you in more trouble than you can ever get yourself out of. I, if I remember correctly, you know, it, it hasn't even been a week ago that Baker Mayfield went to the Cleveland Browns and asked for a trade because he was a little peeved that, you know, they were talking about that they had met with Deshaun Watson, that they were talking about J Deshaun Watson. So he gets his panties in a bunch and he posts something over on um, 
on social media, almost like a goodbye to the city of Cleveland. And then they turn around and they make the trade. And now Baker's on the outside looking in with not a whole lot of interest from a whole lot of people, a whole lot of teams, I should say. Now, there's a couple of teams in need. Um, the Washington Commanders need a quarterback. The Seattle Seahawks need a quarterback. Uh, even though the Texans, you know, seem like they could use an upgrade, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, Davis Mills seems to be their guy. Um, and then you got the Steelers, and you've got um, Mason Rudolph and um, and Dwayne Haskins there. But you got to be thinking um, – that there's an upgrade needed there. Um, a blast from the past resurfaced in social media last week and looked pretty damn good, you know, if I do say so myself. One, um, Colin Kaepernick, you know, has just been working out with some of the veterans, particularly the Lockett brothers, um, recently, and um, he looked pretty darn good. You know, I, I said it a long time ago, and I continue to believe it. I do not believe that um, he'll ever get another shot in the NFL. I think he's been blackballed, and um, it's it's really it's really a shame um, because obviously the kid can still play. Um, there's a lot left in him. There's a lot left in that arm, and um, I would love to see him get an opportunity. Um, Adam. You know, just threw up here, you know, Mitchell Trubisky. Um, and it seems like, you know, Trubisky is going to get himself uh, another shot at being a starter um, once again. Um, th there's just a lot going on. Uh, Jameis Winston. Uh, let, me, let me not forget these two guys. Jameis Winston resigns for the Saints for two years. Um, 28 million, 21 guaranteed. Um Marcus Mariota to the Falcons with the Matt Ryan move. Two years, 18.7 million. Um, listen, there, there's a, a lot going on. And, you know, these teams, teams feel as though you got to have a franchise quarterback. And some quarterbacks who kind of fell down before have found themselves, you know, getting a second chance, you know, at this thing. And a lot of it is a result of, um, a lot of it is the result of uh, what you saw with Sean McVay and what, what he did last year and the success that the L.A. Rams had with being able to go get that quarterback when they needed him um, and turn around and, and win a Super Bowl. Um, Malik Willis of Liberty um, had his pro day today. And my goodness, um, from all intents and purposes, Seems like he really helped himself and drove his stock up today. Um, the reports were that he was throwing laser beams um, in his workout today. Um, so much going on, like I said. You know, and then you got you know your Philadelphia Eagles. You know, what are Eagles going to do? And um, you know, I before we get started on the the talk to him side of it and trying to bring some of you guys in, I'm going to go back and I'm going to, you know, pop up some of your questions here. But if you guys want to be a part of the show, you want to come on with me. Okay. I need you guys to kind of raise your hands um, and let me know because, you know, for the sake and the quality of the show, I want to make sure that, you know, we can keep, um, you know, the quality of the viewing where it needs to be. So I know everybody wants to get on and everybody's got a phone, a camera phone, and everybody's got the latest and the greatest. But what I would love for you guys to do is if you have a laptop with a camera and the quality is good, give me a thumbs up in your comment if you want to come on. That way my producer knows who to click in and who not to click in. Um, if I don't see the thumbs up, then, you know, we will wait until we have someone that does. And again, what we're going to do um, is we're going to um, send you a link. OK, um, you'll be able to 
log into the show with the link and put your name down at the bottom. And when I see your name down at the bottom, then I'll see you down at the bottom as well. And then I can bring you on the show and we can begin to have a, a, a quick conversation. Um, but before we start doing that, Jonathan Granger, see, oh, Lamont. Okay. All right. All right. Well, make sure you, okay. So I see the thumbs, but then tell me what you want to talk about. Cause I want to talk about everything. Okay. I get most of this. Most of the talk is Eagles talk. And listen, I want to talk about the Eagles, but we're in the off season now. We're not really in season and the Eagles haven't done a whole lot. Um, as far as, you know, the free agent market is concerned. Um, so make sure you, with the thumbs up, you know, if you get into the private chat with my producer, make sure you let her know that, um, you know, what it is that you want to talk about. And then she will send you the link and um, I'll bring you in. Let's jump over to a little bit of Eagles talk um, before we get to, you know, the talk to them and the interactive side. The Eagles, like I said, have not been overly um, aggressive in this free agent market. You know, Hassan Reddick signed with the Eagles last week. You know, we need pass rush. I'm just, you know, a little leery about it because I'm not sure how they're going to use him on a continuous basis because I don't believe that you can line him up at defensive end at 235 pounds every single down and think that he's going to be um, as effective as he needs to be. Um, you got um, Zach Pascal, who was just signed. You know, listen, I was, I was, you know, capping for, uh, or caping, I should say, for Julio Jones last week. A lot of people felt like, and I got a lot of comments that said, hey, you know, the guy's always hurt. I'll take a pass. You know, sometimes it's not necessarily about um, the production that you can get from a guy, depending on um, where he is in his career. But, you know, we've got a, a bunch of young wide receivers. I think our oldest group of wide receivers are, um, you know, they're going on their third year coming up. Most of the guys on our roster, with the exception of Greg Ward, are just, you know, they're young. Um, let me see. Victor Parker, you know, he just jumped on talking about, you know, Jarvis Landry. You know, let me tell you, this is my opinion on Jarvis Landry. Jarvis Landry has been, you know, and granted, he's been playing with Baker Mayfield. So I'll take that into account. But he hasn't been a world beater. Jarvis Landry isn't the type of guy that you're afraid that he's going to run by you and run away from you. We got enough possession receivers. You know, we need a guy who can who can stretch the field, a bigger body, you know, a guy, you know, that that has to be accounted for. But I digress. I go back because I want to finish my point on Julio Jones. The other thing is you need a, a veteran. You need a guy who can come in and talk with these young receivers and teach these young receivers how to play the game, man. You know, I just think that there's a lot of youth there and a guy like Julio to come in and mentor these young guys, to talk to these young guys, to teach them what it's like and what's necessary to be a pro. Um, in my opinion, um, that would supersede his ability to stay healthy because you don't need a guy to come in and be an every down guy with all these young guys that you have. You need a guy that you can count on that can get you positive yards when you need it to be able to move the chains. Um, but very few of these, these guys that, that are now available because of how fast they went in the free agent market, very, they're just not going to, you know, they're not guys that you're going to bring in and play them every single down, but you still need that mentorship, if you would. You still need that veteran mentorship um, for for these young guys. Um, so I go back to, you know, Pascal, and, and I'm wondering because the decision was made, you know, obviously this coaching staff has had um, a lot of uh, familiarity with um, Zach Pascal. You know, he's been with the Colts for four years, um, obviously with 19, you know, 2019, 2020 was his most productive year with 14 yards per catch those two years and five touchdowns. Um, he had a down year last year, if you will. Um, his numbers were down a little bit. He, he only had 10 yards to catch. 
and um and three touchdowns um not not sure whether you know that was because of a Nick Foles thing or whether he was injured or what but it's rare that you see a guy's numbers go down after year three, especially because he's been ascending. Um, so, like I said, you know, the Eagles haven't been all that active. You know, they've made some moves as far as the salary cap is concerned. They released Fletcher and then, you know, they brought him back. Um, they um, released Boston Scott and then, you know, figured out a way to get him signed and got him back. You know, Greg Ward, they tendered him and got him re-signed. But the Eagles haven't really done a whole lot. And, um, you know, right now they're between 24 and 27, 24 and $30 million under the cap. Um, I get it. That's not a whole lot of breathing room. Um, and a lot of the decision-making is going to do with, have to do with, you know, what do they do with these three first-round draft picks at 15, 16, and 19? Um do you pick up? Do you use those draft picks? And if you make a decision to to exercise all three of those picks, and I get the feeling that how we won't. Um, if you make a decision to do that, then you got to take into account that is three first round salaries that you have to account for. So a good portion, probably somewhere between ten and seven and twelve million of that that money, if you take all three of those picks has to be allocated towards that now you're talking 23 to 20 million dollars in cap space now that makes things just a little bit more difficult from the standpoint of you know how you know how you're what you're doing in the free agent market okay um you've also got um massive needs in my opinion I still believe that, um, you know, you, you've got, you know, an off the ball linebacker need. You've got a need for safety. Um, you've got a need for defensive tackle and defensive in depth. Okay. It's one thing to, you know, you, you lost Hassan Ridgeway, and you got Fletcher, you've got Javon, and you've got uh, Milton Williams. But in my opinion, you need one more guy there um for depth purposes you know you need wide receiver insurance um you need o-line depth and lastly what i'd love to see is you know some number two um tight end competition um they need to elevate that position um because as good as dallas goddard is and as good as i believe that he'll continue to be I still think that you need another, a second tight end just in case he gets hurt or second tight end to keep him, a guy like him motivated after he's been extended. Okay. So let's talk about, Hey, you know, who wants to come on? I'm going to scroll back and I'm going to jump into some of your questions. Um, you know, go back to the top and go back through some of your questions, but uh, my producer's asking me, hey, who wants to come on? Who wants to come on and chat? Okay. Um, let's see. Um, let's jump into this one first. So Thomas Sharp asked, he said, you touched briefly on Michael Parsons last week. Despite any number of other needs and certain questionable scouting decisions by the front office, how does someone like that from Harrisburg, not to mention Penn State fly under the Eagles radar. But Thomas, I think, you know, um, you just have to know that that position is not a priority for the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, all you have to do is look at the guys that they've tried to start, the guys that they've tried to play at that position over the last couple of years. And it's easy for you to understand that they just don't value, you know, the off the ball linebacker position. They want outside linebackers. They want defensive linemen. They want defensive ends. Um, but they feel as though they can get by, you know, on the strength of the defensive line with mediocre linebackers, you know. And it, to me, it just doesn't work. I mean, especially when you think about 
especially when you think about the way the defenses are played nowadays, there's a whole lot of debate about, okay, if I got a guy like Khalil Mack or a guy like Vaughn Miller, you know, he's labeled an outside linebacker, you know? So the thought is, oh, you know what? We're really playing a 30 front with an outside linebacker. No, you're not. You're playing a 40 front. You got four down linemen and your weak side defensive end is really a linebacker. He's not, he's not a defensive end. Okay. But in everybody's scheme today, you are basically playing a 4-2 front. And I've said it a thousand times. I'll say it again right here. If that's the way that teams are going to play football nowadays, especially when you can keep a tight end in and you got six on six in the box, then guess what? Those two guys is in the middle. Those two linebackers, they better be hell raisers. They better be good damn inside backers because you don't have the third guy anymore. And oftentimes you have to drop the, the a safety in the box just to give you the extra guy to give you the help in the box that you need versus the run game because it's man on man, five down linemen and a tight end against four down defensive linemen and two linebackers. That's man blocking. And depending on, depending on what the front looks like, you know, you're going to get man blocking every single time. So, Somebody's got to get off to pl- get off a block and make a tackle, whether it's a defensive lineman or whether it's a linebacker. And if you're weak at the linebacker position and you're good enough to double team a guy like Fletcher Cox and push him two, three, four, five yards off the ball, and then work up to the second level, your linebackers don't have a, don't stand a chance because they're not understanding where they fit and they're not understanding how to take the double team off of Fletcher and Javon. And when that happens your run defense suffers, you know, and then your big guys get tired. And they get to a point where they can't give you top level um, effort. But listen, Thomas, I get you. You know, you talk about Michael Parsons, love the guy. You know, I said it last week. I think that he's a difference maker. He's a difference maker in that, you know, you understand how he changed that defense. You know, the level of intensity that he brought as a young player. How in the world could you get that guy to come in and play at that level and everybody else on that defense doesn't step up their game? It's just impossible. It's not going to happen. And he made that defense better. Could the Eagles have, you know, could the Eagles have potentially gotten him? Yeah. I mean, the way that they were maneuvering and what they were doing, but he wasn't even on their radar because that's not one of those situations um it's not one of those situations where the eagles were looking to solidify that that position i mean you got to realize the eagles haven't drafted a linebacker you know in the first round since the 19 and i think 1979 i think the number was and i think michael kendricks might have been the highest pick that they've used at that position um since that 79 draft so it's pretty evident that they they clearly do not um, value that position enough to spend a high enough draft pick on one of those guys. It, it's, this is the this year is the perfect case scenario for the Eagles to be able to step in and step up and snag a a linebacker that really makes a difference, you know. And in my opinion, it needs to be Nicobe Dean or it has to be Devin Lloyd. One of those two guys, if they fall to them anywhere within that range of 15 and 19, um, I think that they've got to figure out how to get one of those guys uh, because those guys, are gonna be, they're going to make a difference. They're going to make a massive difference, okay? Still waiting to figure out, you know, who's going to join me today. Um, and um, listen, we'll work through that. But in the meantime... We will continue to um, pop out some of these questions here. Um, Let's see. Elliot. Elliot says, is there players that will not go to certain teams because of someone else they're friends with? Or is that just a smokescreen for the fact that Watson didn't want to be in Philly? Um, Listen, these guys are playing a a game for King's Ransom. 
And a lot of times, more more times than not, the Kings ransom has more to do with why a player will go to a team opposed to why a player won't go to a team. There's been situations where players have gone to teams and it kind of left you scratching your head. Listen, I know from firsthand experience, you know, um, going to Arizona Cardinals was, you know, a leaving Philadelphia and going to Arizona to play for the Cardinals. I mean, it was a business decision. You know, it wasn't that I didn't believe that Buddy could turn things around with the with the Arizona Cardinals. Um, I just always looked at that organization and that team and, and wondered to myself, you know, how with all the talent that that team has, why is it so hard for that organization to win? Um, and I thought that Buddy could get it done. But after being, you know, in Arizona for one year, I clearly understood why the team, you know, wasn't winning and why it probably couldn't win. Um, but nonetheless, it was more of a financial decision, you know, and a decision to, you know, put myself in a situation where I could get off AstroTurf and on grass for the longevity of my career more than anything else. Um, listen, there's 53 guys on the roster. Not everybody's going to like each other. You know, even when I was on Philadelphia, players on my own defense that I didn't like. There were guys on the offense that I didn't like. But guess what? We all wore the same color. We were all fighting for the same common goal. And with that being the case, you know, on Sundays, we were on the same team. Now, that didn't mean I wanted to go out and have a beer with him. It didn't mean I wanted to go out and, you know, have dinner with him or anything like that. You know, we just, some people get along with, some people you don't. But, you know, business is business. Work is work. Um, so I don't really buy into that. Um, I just think that Deshaun Watson looked at the Philadelphia Eagles um, roster, currently how they're constructed as an offense, um, you know, and, and, and all of those things that a quarterback would take notice of and look at um, for his betterment. And he realized that this team is not where it needs to be that this team isn't ready. And he spent a good portion of his NFL career in a city and looking at an organization that wasn't committed to winning, that wasn't committed to getting him all the pieces. As a matter of fact, traded away, you know, arguably the best wide receiver in the league and left him at, at a deficit. And he came back the next year and still had the best year of his career. You know, I think Deshaun Watson looked at it from that standpoint. What's best for me? What's going to help me get to the to to the Super Bowl? What's going to help me to advance my career? And he just didn't see that possible, you know, in Philadelphia. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong at all. Um, let's see. Um, okay, here we go. What's up with the rumor? What rumor about Jalen? I'm not so sure that I know what that rumor is. <laughs> Um, let's see. Mm. Mm, let's jump in over here. Um, to one, um, great show. This team needs to build a defense with young talent. I think a veteran wideout would help this team. Listen, we're we're on the same we're on the same same page. To be honest, you know, I, I think the team needs an upgrade. Uh, you know, defensively, um, you know, I hope because the decision has already been been made that um, um, that Pascal, you know, is that answer you know, to the veteran receiver that we're talking about. Um, but, you know, we just, listen, we live in an age where everything is defense, 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 defense. De I mean, offense, offense, offense. And everybody feels like, you know, hey, if I can put a good offense out on the field, then I have a better chance at winning than I do if, you know, then if I have a defense, because a, a great offense will always supersede, you know, the way that defenses are played, you know, today. Um, but I'll submit to you that 
I think that if you're going to win a championship, then you're going to need to have a pretty darn good defense. You know, let, let me ask you a question. Do the, do the LA Rams win the Super Bowl this year without the defense and the way that it played during down that last stretch of, of, of the game? You know, I would say no. I mean, if you don't have Vaughn Miller and you don't have Aaron Donald, and I'm not saying that the Eagles have to have players of that skill level, it would be nice. But those, in my opinion, those those types of players are generational players. Um, are they winning, you know, without, you know, a solid defense? Hell no, they're not winning that game. You know, I, I don't care. I don't care what you know, Matthew Stafford and Cooper Cup did down the stretch. You know, the MVP in that Super Bowl was Aaron Donald. You know, I mean, if anybody watching that Super Bowl who really understands and knows football, they know that it was Aaron Donald and the pressure that he bought and the way that he played and the way that Vaughn Miller played and the rest of that defense played that won them that game. Because when they really need to step up and get it done, Hey, that's where they got it done on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, you know, they went down the field. Stafford went down the field with Cooper Cup being the only guy. That's the thing that blew my mind about that whole situation is that, okay, OBJ is hurt. You lost your tight end. And you mean to tell me that you're going to let the quarterback throw the ball to one guy and beat you the way that, you know, Cincinnati got beat by Cooper Cup? Like, you don't have a defense to take Cooper Cup away on every level? That just, like, blew my mind. It blew, it absolutely blew my mind that that coaching staff had no remedy for Cooper Cup. I mean, play a boxing one, whatever the hell you want to do. But you can't let one wide receiver just dominate the game that way, okay? But that game, at the end of the day, you know, everybody will say, oh, Stafford, and Cooper Cup and Cooper Cup did have a hell of a year, and Matthew Stafford did play extremely well. That Super Bowl was won because of Von Miller and Aaron Donald and that defense. Okay, so you got to figure out at some point you're going to need that defense. You're going to need for them to step up and make a stop and and, and do something great. Um, no matter how much how many points you score, if the other team can keep count with you then it always comes down to, hmm, who has the ball last and who's the most proficient quarterback? Or it comes down to who has a dominant defense that can get a stop when you really need to have a stop. And there's nothing wrong with having both, okay? Nothing wrong. And the Philadelphia Eagles need to figure out how to build a complementary defense to, you know, what they're trying to build on the offensive side of the ball, okay? All right. I guess nobody wants to join me today because um, even though I see some hands raised and some um, and some um, thumbs up, um, I haven't seen anybody click in yet, which means that, you know, my, um, my producer hasn't gotten um, – a source to send you a link. So let's jump over to Philip. Philip Barber wants to know, do I still believe in Davion Taylor? I do. Hey, listen, I, I, I told you guys, I, I love Davion Taylor. The only problem I have with Davion Taylor is that, um, you know, he's pretty raw and he needs to learn and he needs to learn quickly the nuances of playing the linebacker position. Listen, the kid can run, he's strong, and he gets to the ball with an attitude when he when he arrives. He's a sure tackler. I mean, he might be the best tackling linebacker that we have. But when you watch him play, you can tell that there's a lot of indecision because his eyes haven't been trained properly to look at the right things that gives him all the cues and all the clues to where the football is and where the football is going. Um, but when he figures it out, when he gets it right, I mean, the guy plays all out. Now, he's got a lot of ability. I mean, he's got the type of talent that I saw in Michael Kendricks. 
the question is, can this coaching staff speed up his ability to um, to improve? And can he step into that role? And most importantly, can he stay healthy? Because he had, he had a couple opportunities last year to step in and be a starter, and he could not stay healthy. I mean, from, from training camp all the way through the season. I mean, this, this kid just stayed beat up the entire year, missed multiple games. Um, you, you know, if you're going to be a starter in this league, you got to figure out how to keep yourself healthy, whether that means, you know, ramping up your offseason training, um, you know, working a little harder doing doing training camp and preseason. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Um, but you're not going to win a, a starting job in the tub. You know, we used to have an old saying, you know, he's hell when he's well, but he's always in the tub. You can't win a starting job in the tub. You know, you got to be a guy that the coaching staff can rely on, a guy that your teammates can rely on, and so on and so forth. Um, Rebel Hill wants to know, um, do you think Kelsey has another Pro Bowl season in him? Should the Eagles draft their center of the future this year to learn under Kelsey? Well, it's it's interesting, you know, that you asked that question because um, Landon Dickerson actually was drafted to be the heir apparent at center because Jason Kelsey has been tossing around this thought that he was going to retire for the last couple of years. Well, um, he played so well at left guard last year, you know, when when Isaac Sayamalo went down, that um, I think he's pretty much solidified that that spot. Now, people don't realize Isaac Sayamalo was also drafted because he could play center and guard. So if you can get him back 100% healthy, and I'm not sure what his contract status is, whether he's a free agent and he's got another year or he can be tendered, you know, this year. Um, but if you can get him back healthy, that just gives you that much more depth because you got a guy that can play center and a guy that can play guard. So if Jason Kelsey does get hurt, God forbid, you know, maybe Sam Malo can step in. He can step in at center. He can step in at guard. Um, but to be honest with you, I really wouldn't mess with Landon Dickerson um, at at left guard. I just wouldn't. You know, now there's a need at right guard. Um, I think they like Herbig. Um, I'm not so sure that, you know, he can get to a place where he can be as dominant as Brandon Brooks was when he was healthy. But, you know, he can get the job done. I mean, you, you're talking about a team that was, you know, in the tops running the football last year and and yet a team for the first seven games of the season really didn't run it that that much um but um i i, I get the sense that you know how he's going to do something crazy in this with these three picks and with one of those three picks i think we see an offensive lineman being drafted um especially if he keeps all three. Now, if he drafts, if he, if he um, trades some, some, um, some capital away to be able to move up or to gain capital down the road, maybe we see a guy drafted in the third or fourth round. But if he keeps all three of those draft picks in the first round, I get the sense that one of those draft picks are going to be um, an offensive lineman. Um, somewhere along the way. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Um, all right, Derek. Derek says he wants to chat, chat it up about the Eagles front office philosophy on defense. Um, well, listen, their philosophy is, you know, they, you, that you build from the defensive front backwards. I think, you know, we can all see that you got most of the money on the defensive side of the ball, almost the, the lion's share of the money in the defensive front. You can tell that's the way that Jim Schwartz wanted to play defense. And that certainly is the way that uh, Jonathan Gannon wants to play defense. 
is you know from the from the defensive front because neither one of them look really like the blitz that much and i'm not so sure that now that that's not a howie roseman philosophy as well that hey we want to be able to attack from the defensive line position and not really have to commit our assets behind the defensive line meaning the linebackers and safeties you know to the pass rush um i don't know it's it's just it's it's interesting to me because philadelphia has always been you know a defensive city you know i mean you go back to um dick vermeil's defense and then buddy ryan's defense and then when you know buddy was relieved of his duties you know but carson came in was our defense coordinator you know for third for three years and you know that was also along the period in time you know where we were you know, just dominant on the defensive side of the ball. And then you move into, you know, the Jim Johnson era, you know, where, you know, they dominated on the defensive side of the ball. And obviously, you know, the linchpin at that time was was um, was Brian Dawkins. But, you know, the Philadelphia Eagles, the city of Philadelphia has always been a very aggressive defensive city, you know. And for the last six years, we have not been there. Five years through – Jim Schwartz and last year with Jonathan Gannon, we've been pretty darn passive. You know, Bimba don't break. And that's not really Philadelphia. But I, I get the sense that um, – good question, Derek. I get the sense that those philosophies from Jim Schwartz and Jonathan Gannon has now rubbed off on Harry Roseman and those underneath him and how they look at what an offense – or what a defense, I should say, excuse me, should look like, how it should perform, how it should be built. You know, when you've got Fletcher Cox, former first round pick, Javon Hargrave um, traded for, um, Brandon Graham, I believe he was a, you know, former first round pick. You got Josh Sweat. Um, I forget, I believe Josh was third round, third, maybe four. Um, and now you go and you draft the former first, you, 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 you bring in a former first rounder and Hassan Reddick. Um, it's pretty darn evident, you know, how they, how they're looking at building, you know, this defense is really all about the defensive front. And at the end of the day, um, the linebackers are an afterthought, you know, not the cornerbacks, but the linebackers are an afterthought. Because they feel like if we can get pressure and we can dominate the line of scrimmage with the defensive line, that's going to make the cornerbacks. That means the two outside guys and the slot corner. It'll make their job easier. It'll make the linebackers' job easier. And it'll make, you know, the safety's jobs easier. But in my opinion, that's just not, you know, how it really works. You know, why not be dominant all the way across the board rather than just, you know, in one specific area? Um, this is an interesting question. Because uh, I had a lot of people that asked me about this over the last couple of weeks. You know, Adam wants to know, what about bringing in Bobby Wagner and Patrick Peterson? Um, listen, I, I believe that Bobby Wagner, Wagner's got a lot left in the tank. I think the guy's only been playing nine years. I mean, he's still under the 10-year mark in the NFL. You know, the problem with Bobby is, you know, because he's still, you know, got a le lot left in the tank, He's a guy that's not going to come in, you know, for peanuts after playing for the type of, you know, coin that he's played for for the last eight years, eight, seven, eight years of his career um, and believing that he's still a guy that can get it done. And I believe he made another Pro Bowl last year. Why would he come in and play for less? So he might be out of the Eagles bar park as far as, you know, the dollars are concerned. We talked about the salary cap and where they are and what they have to spend right now. Um, the Eagles are not going to invest 10 plus million dollars a year in a linebacker, let alone the draft picks. Okay. There's been a lot of talk about Patrick Peterson. Um, you know, I've seen him up close and personal because I live here in Arizona. So I watched him. The Cardinals drafted him out of LSU in the first round. He was highly productive got towards the end of his career and, um, you know, father time is catching up with him. He spent a year in Minnesota last year, um, had an okay season, nothing really, 
you know, to write home about. The Eagles need a need, a, need another a corner, but I think the Eagles need a young corner. I, you know, after watching Patrick Patrick Peterson, and, and that's the thing about these cornerbacks who have supreme speed um, and talent. When the game catches up with them, um, it's just not a pretty sight. And you could see, I, I can see that the confidence isn't there that once was there with Pat, Patrick Peterson. Um, you know, the bravado is still there. You know, the the chatter is still the, still there because deep down inside, he really believes that, you know, he's still the Patrick Peterson of old. But I've seen the guy and I've seen his, his um his talents begin to wane over the last couple of years. Um, and I think the Eagles need to get younger at the cornerback position more than they need a veteran at the cornerback position. Because again, the roster's not quite ready for them to challenge for a Super Bowl. So if you need another year or two to get yourself there and you're still trying to figure it out with your quarterback, then why would you bring on these these older guys? You know? And, and some of you, I can hear some of you now. Oh, but you said Julio Jones would be, and he's an older guy. No, what I mean at that position is you already got a lot of youth at the wide receiver position. You need some, 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 a veteran leader there to help those young guys learn what it is to be a pro. Now, when you jump over on the, on the defensive side of the ball and you're talking about cornerback, okay, you don't need age there you already got a veteran in a in a, in a perennial all pro in Darius Slut. Avante Maddox is already is, has already spent you know a lot of time as a young guy who's developed and grown you need a young guy over there that can develop over time that and, and, and even if you even if you draft a guy now maybe a guy in in one of these positions that's you know, that's ready, that's ready to step in and start, then that's not a problem because at least he's got the leadership and the mentorship on that side in his, in that room, in the DB room that can help him get better. Um, but I just don't see uh, Patrick Peterson, you know, as an answer for what the Eagles need um, at this point in time. Um, let's see. What else do we have? Um, <laughs> Thomas, I'm just, I was, I was laughing. So I just decided I'd go ahead and read your question. Um, do you think the Eagles should take a quarterback? Um, if Malik, Malik, um, um, Willis or Kenny Pickett is there. Um, I don't really believe that, um, I don't really believe that the Eagles have that much of a doubt that Jalen Hurts deserves this year. Um, I don't know that either one of those guys at this point in time would come in and be that much better than Jalen Hurts is at this point in time. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you make the decision, to draft a young quarterback, that's not going to move Jalen Hurts like it moved Carson Wentz. Jalen's just going to say, okay, hey, bring on the competition. And he'll go to work and feel like, you know, he has what it takes to win out at the position. But if you make that decision and then you decide, okay, we're going to go with this guy and we're going to move off of Hurts, Realize that everything that you that the Eagles as an organization as a team had to endure last year, you're going to repeat that again this year, okay? With a young quarterback, because those young guys are coming from the minor leagues, if you will, to the major leagues, and there's a learning curve for every quarterback. So what you saw Jalen Hurts go through last year was a learning curve. He should be better this year for what he experienced last year. It would be no different than if you went and you picked one of these young guys this year and you made the decision that they were going to be the guy. No, don't waste those draft picks on a guy that, you know, you're going to have to wait two to three years down the road to realize 
a return from. You've got bigger fish to fry. Continue to build your roster. And when your roster, I'll say it again, when your roster gets to a point where you're ready to compete, then you can spend the assets, the draft capital, um, you know, even the players in a trade to be able to go and get the guy that you need that you feel will get you over the top. Um, but this isn't a draft to do that. Um, let's see. All right, Victor. Victor said, you know, I'm, uh, and I'm sure this is in in response to my my comment about us needing competition at number two. You know, we got Richard Rogers. I like, and Tyree Jackson would be good. And there's, there's nothing nothing wrong with either one of those guys. I'm not saying you go and draft a tight end in the first round, um, but Richard Rogers, you know, for the most part, is a blocking tight end. Tyrese Jackson is a converted quarterback who got hurt in training camp last year and, um, you know, came back towards the end of the year and really, you know, had lost so much in injury that, you know, he could not pick up where he left off in training camp. Um, the only reason I say competition is because competition makes the cream rise to the top. If you want to find out, you know, if you want to find out, you want to get the best out of your football players, the best thing that you can offer them is an environment of competition. Don't have a guy come in feeling like he's the guy, that he's got it wrapped up. Now, everybody knows that the starter at tight end is Dallas Goddard. There are certain positions on this team that are locked up, but that doesn't mean that you can't have competition at the backup position. Because how many times are the Eagles going to get in 12 personnel? One tight, with two tight ends, and well, one back and two tight ends. Okay. How many times are they going to get in, you know, in, in 13 personnel? You know, when they really want to run the ball or in short yards or goal line. Okay. So you're going to need two more tight ends either way. But if you remember last year, there was a precipitous drop off when Dallas got it, got hurt those couple of games. Um, at the tight end position. Not only was it not only was it a, a, a drop off as far as the blocking was concerned and how it affected the running game, but even when you wanted to pass the ball, you didn't have the efficiency there. I think every team needs at least two viable tight ends. Okay? And one of those guys has to be, you know, an inline guy that can block and the other guy's got to be a guy that you know he can move motion you can detach him and line him up outside but he can create a lot of problems in the passing game now we, we got the best of both worlds in dallas got it we didn't have that in zach Ertz. zach Ertz was going to catch the hell out of the ball but he wasn't going to block nobody he didn't want to block anybody okay you got the best of both worlds in dallas goddard but man how much more dominant could you know that position be if we, you know, found another tight end, whether that be Jackson or Rogers, I think we know what Rogers is. The, the jury's still out on Jackson, but if he can evolve into that guy that can have one of those skill sets, that makes that position that much more powerful and allows them to do um, a lot more things from an offensive standpoint. Um, so that's the only reason I brought that up that way. Um, let me see. <laughs> Joseph Ford wants to know a historical question. Um, position by position, I proved that the 91 Birds defense is better than 85 Bears. Interested? Um, I am. Um, I just got to figure out how to get you on so we can have the banter. Um, you know, as, as a Birds fan, I'm pretty sure, you know, you're probably, you know, leaning more to the Birds than you are the, the Bears. The fundamental difference is, you know, they were able to close the deal. You know, we weren't able to do that. You know, the 2017 Birds were able to do that. But, you know, my 91, you know, Birds defense, we weren't, and, and team, we weren't able to, to close the deal. And that's the difference between, you know, these two defenses. 
And a lot of people will say because of that, you know, um, case closed. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um, Jeff wants to know, uh, why do you think Eric Allen is not in the Hall of Fame? He is just good as numbers is my better career stats than Daryl Green and Aeneas Williams. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Jeff. I am miffed every single time that I see another defensive back, and I don't give a damn whether it's a cornerback or whether it's a safety or whether it's, you know, a, 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 um, a rover. I don't give a damn what it is. I get pissed off every single time I see another defensive back going to the Hall of Fame and a guy like Eric Allen doesn't get his just due because his numbers are the same. It's clearly not just about winning Super Bowls. You know, he's he's up there. He has the same same number. When I look at Ty Law, when I look at, um, you know, Leroy Butler, who just went in this year, when I look at um, um, John Lynch, when I look at all of these guys, it's just like it blows my mind because his numbers are right there. I mean, when I when, when Aeneas Williams got elected in and you're talking about two guys that I played with, I played in the same team with both Eric Allen and I spent three years with Aeneas Williams. OK. And Aeneas Williams was a hell of a hell of a cornerback. Aeneas Williams never won a Super Bowl. As a matter of fact, he lost him one. But he never won one. And his numbers are no greater, no better, no much more impressive than Eric Allen's. And it drives me insane that each and every year goes by and my dude can't even get in the top 25. He can't even get in the last 25. It makes no damn sense whatsoever, you know. But that's why, you know, I try not to get caught up in all that Hall of Fame talk because it's all subjective. You know, the people who the people who um make the decisions about who goes into Hall of Fames, they're the ones that make the decisions. And you can argue it all day long. It's not going to change it. No way. Okay. Um, my producer is trying to stir the pot here because she knows the answer to this question, just like you do, Pick 6-6 six, six Sports. Okay. Who's better, Reggie White or Aaron Donald? Come on. Come on. I I'm, I'm just going to click this off and ask my producer to give me another question. Because I watched probably the greatest defensive player to ever play the game. I played right next to him, okay, for, what, seven out of my 13 years. 6'5", 295 pounds, could probably run faster than me, as strong as an ox, how about two or three oxes, and was just dominant. And you want to know the thing about it? He was just a nice guy. It's a nice guy. The thing you didn't want to do is you didn't want to piss him off. Because once you pissed him off and you got him mad, you know, now it was, went to another level. You could put two guys or three guys. Whatever you wanted to do, you couldn't stop him. Okay? I see Aaron Donald getting double teamed and shut down at the line of scrimmage. I don't think I've ever seen Reggie White get shut down like that. And that's not to take anything away from Aaron Donald because I think that he is one of the greatest defensive players of his era. But Reggie White is one of the greatest defensive players of all time, you know, and, and I can go, I can look and find a whole lot of other guys that I can throw into that and ask those questions. All right. Um, Green Man Miller wants to know, do I think that Gannon will call better games? Um, you, you, you remember when Chip Kelly had his little playbook and his little playbook, if you guys remember, was about that big. And everybody, and everybody, all the other coaches had play sheets that were like that long, that wide, and they would always cover their mouth and they would call them plays, right? When I look at Jonathan Gannon, Jonathan Gannon's got a little play sheet, you know, that's kind of like chips. It's about that big. That leads me to believe that there's, he's really there's he's limited as to what it is that he can call and the variety of what he does. Because at no time last year did we see any kind of change, any morphing of defenses, um, being shown something in a game that we hadn't seen before, you know. So I wonder, whoever he was a defensive backs coach under, what kind of system he learned 
And how many other coaches did he coach on that he has all of this information that he could take it and morph it into something else and be creative with it? I don't see it. So when you ask that question, um, I'd like to say yes, but until I can see it, you know, the answer is absolutely not because I just don't see, you know, the creativity. I don't see the aggression. Um, and he seems to be locked into that's how he's going to do it. And the organization seems to be locked into being okay with it. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it'll be interesting to watch. Okay. Hey, guys, that's the show for today. Um, as always, you guys make sure that you take care of each other and be good to one another. But most importantly, make sure that you love each other. I'll be right here with you next week um, with another edition of the Seth Jordan Show. I want to thank um, my producer behind the scenes, Kate Beasy, today. And um, as always, you know, Make sure you're taking care of each other, and I'll see you guys right back here next week, same place, same time. Peace.